All right, so there's effectively two ways you can build a rock line electrolyzer, or any electrolyzer for that, for that matter. There's a monopolar and unipolar cell configuration. So a unipolar cell is where you have current going into each electrode. Uh, and in a bipolar cell, you have current passing through the first set of electrodes, or the first electrode for that matter, and that can be the positive and negative, and it exits at the final electrode. So if those are familiar with dry cells or HHO cells, you'll, you'll notice that they call them neutral plates. So they're actually not technically the right term because in an electrolyzer, a commercial scale electrolyzer, um, most of the electrodes are what they abbreviate neutral plates, which they're not really neutral because current's still passing through them. And if current passes through each electrode, it forms an anode and a cathode on actually each side of that electrode. So um, if, if you imagine a... Um, most alkaline electrolyzers that, that I'm aware of use a, a bipolar cell configuration. So you can see here, you got the, the, the current coming in, but it's not attached right to each um, electrode. So you don't have a positive right attached at the end of this electrode and a, and a negative po attached at this electrode. Um, it passes through through the electrolyte medium. So um, in this case, you would have, um, for example, if you if you had a, um, let me find it. Yeah, if you had 250 electro electrolysis cells, which each cell is a is an electrode, a negative positive electrode, and a diaphragm separator, um, you're going to have three 300 volts to 550 volts. So obviously, you can't connect that 350 volts right to each electrode because then the 350 volts would be each electrode would be receiving 350 volts. That's obviously way too much. So you divide the total voltage by the number of cells to get the cell voltage. Um, so in, in the case of a, a, a unipolar cell, you, you actually have to have the voltage coming in at each electrode at that exact voltage, right? Because there's no reducing effect. So each time um, you, you have a, a... So there's actually a really good video by an, uh, an HHO guy on YouTube where he explains this. So if you hook up the current on one plate, and then you hook up the current on the other plate, so this would be the positive, let's say this would be the, the negative at the, at the other end. Um, let's say you have 12 volts across this entire uh, electrode. In reality, between each cell, you might only have two volts. And, but that, act, that cell in the middle is still re receiving current, right? It's, it's energized. Um, but each time current flow, because you see, there's no connection between two electrode plates. If you have a connection, then by definition, it can't be an electrode, right? It's going to be one electrode. See, they're not all stacked up against each other and connected. That would defeat the purpose. The current is actually passing through the electrolyte medium, so that's the alkaline water, um, and jumping from, from one electrode to the other, forming an anode and a cathode each time it does that. So in each prog progressive uh, stepping of the current, so each time the current passes from one electrode to another, it forms an anode and a cathode, and, and that's, that's what they call a unipolar cell. Um, all commercial machines use that configuration. So you can see this one, for example, is using this configuration where you don't have current attached to each one. You have the current going through, let's say, 12 cells, 50 cells, 100 cells, depending depending on the number. Um, and and uh, if we can find, uh, yeah, you, you can you can always find. Yeah, here's here's another one of these machines. Um, you can see there. That that little uh, piece sticking out at the bottom is where the current would would go in. Um, so you can see there the current coming in. So yeah, that that looks like. So that's the on the left hand side. You have looks to be that it's red in the middle. So that's probably the the positive. So current's coming in there, and then it's going to exit at the left side. Um, so, so yeah, if that, yeah, you, you can see there's currents coming in on those little flanges at the side sticking out. Now, um, essentially, the, the reason you have to do this is because if you imagine, um, if you have, <coughs> you, you can't provide two volts, right? There's no power supply in existence that can take, um, because most electrolyzers actually, they, they even if they're running off a solar farm, they, they go from, they convert from AC first, and so they feed into the AC mains, 
and then they rectify back to the DC typically about again depending on the size of the electrolyzer anywhere from 50 volts to 250 volts I mean most electrolyzers on the market right now are operating from between those voltage ranges um, it's just not practical to provide because it's it, you know it's possible you can have on each of these cells right you, you can have a positive coming in and a negative coming in and it's, you can do that but you'd have to have 2 volts or you know 1.7 volts and that just wouldn't be practical so um so regarding power supplies, I mean, the, the cost of a typical DC power supply um, is like $50 per, per kilowatt. I mean, if you look at the Bitcoin miners, they're using the, the, essentially the heaviest duty power supplies you can get. They're probably longer lasting than electrolyzer power supplies. They take in 60 hertz mains and convert to, to 12 volt DC. And these things will last 100,000 hours. I mean, these things run, they're rated for 100,000 hours. And they cost... You know, typically about two hundred dollars for a two hundred watt kit. In fact, you can we can look right now and, and see what they're running for. Like you know, say two thousand watt um, Bitcoin power supply. Typing with one finger, so it's a bit slow. Um, yeah, you, you can see here is for eighteen hundred watts. If you buy three hundred pieces, it's fifty eight dollars. So it's actually less than that. Um, divided by 1.8, that would be thir $32. So, yeah, I mean, a 12-volt power supply using a, uh, a switching power supply, I mean, these things with, with highly compact, um, they're, ver they're very inexpensive. So, um, power supplies, are, you're, they're really not going to be the bottleneck in this system. So... See, I think we, we went over sort of the different configurations for for the power supply to the electrolyzer. Um, unipolar or bipolar. Most of the time, you're going to be bipolar. Okay, so I want to talk quickly about membranes. So what I want to talk about are diaphragm membranes. Okay, so I want to talk quickly about membranes. So these, yeah. So I want to talk quickly about membranes now. The the diaphragm membrane, as it's typically abbreviated, uh, on the alkaline electrolyzer uses the um, polysulfone with zirconium coating, and that's they have a brand name for it. It's called the Zirfon. Now, this membrane. <laughs> Since it's not commercially available, like, I mean, it, it technically is commercially available. You you can buy it, but you know it's not really widely available. Um, it's a specialized item that's only manufactured by, as far as I understand, one company. So it would be better to have to adhere to the COTS methodology um, to have a, um, a synthetic material that we could use. That, you know, it's ubiquitous, right? And so the material we found was. Um, polyether uh, cell phone. Now, it, it's actually similar to the, the material used by the um, so one thing that's really nice about the COTS methodology is that we can actually use uh, currently available materials, uh, synthetic membranes um, that, that are not the zir zircon based systems uh, which are of, of course much more expensive since they're only made by one company um, they have patents on them. You know, they have intellectual property. You can't just go and Alibaba and buy this this technology. Um, the uh, sulfide, uh, co uh, the what we what we've found is the polyether sulfone <laughs> ultra fil filtration membrane, which is it's been used on electrolyzers before successfully. Um, there was an experimental electrolyzer built in this paper here, and they actually used these. Um, and, and what's great about this is that, again, since we're doing the COTS system, you can actually buy the polyether sulfone um, membrane, uh, and it, it's a commercially available product, and it actually performs very well. So here's um, here's actually the, the product that I bought. Um, this is it's got a pore size. They say here the pore size is 0.2 um. I had a 
0.2 UM pore size as well. This guy sold me a yeah, pore size 0.10 to 0.3. I think I got 0.10. Um, storage, storage hydrophilic, so that's what we want. Water will pass through it. Um, these are actually used for water purif purification. Okay. Um, and they're ionically conductive, right? So, th so they'll let the ions flow through. You can run them wide range of pH uh, values. Uh, you can r up operate these at up to, I, I think I saw ADC, um, which is a good temperature range. Um, it, it may, may not have the durability of the Zerfon system. Uh, I'm not claiming it, it does. It, it probably won't. But it's a much, much lower cost solution if you wanted to build an alkaline cell um, off the shelf, right? And, and that's the whole point of this uh, of this video, actually. It's not really a, a technical elaboration of alkaline technology because we're very familiar with the technology. We, you know, there's everything, everything that's been said about this technology has already been said, right? What this, the point of this video is really to illustrate that we can reduce the cost by using off the shelf components um, and we can make these systems for $38 a kilowatt. That, that was really what this is about, right? I mean, if you want to learn about electrolyzers, you can just find a book. Um, there's, there's a whole textbook on it, right? And so, you know, people say, well, the, you know, the materials are not ideal. They're close to ideal, okay? They're close to ideal. I mean, maybe Zerfon is ultimately ideal but it's going to cost four or five times more. I mean, I haven't gotten a quote for it, but this cost me $10 per square meter for, for a 200 um, um, micrometer. Okay? So 200 micrometer, uh, it was $10 a, a, a square foot, which is very cheap. I, I, I do not expect um, the Zerfon to be even in that ballpark. It's probably over $100 per square foot, per square meter, excuse me. So... It just makes a lot more sense to use these systems, uh, off-the-shelf components. Um, and again, you know, I'm not the only one who says you can use this, and it's not a claim out of thin air. You can use these things; they work. Um, and um, and so, yeah, that's that's the point: is that we can build these systems for a lot less than they currently sell for by using this uh, methodology, which is what what has been used successfully to reduce the cost of a lot of other highly specialized products. Um, we've already mentioned that. So there's a lot of opportunity to to bring electrolyzers to market for a lot less than they sell for currently. And that's going to enable low-cost hydrogen that can then be used to produce low-cost green ammonia and eventually pave the way for um, for an ammonia transportation economy, which is really what we're aiming for, as we as we went over in the, in the previous video. So I hope this, um, this could be of use to, to people who are trying to look at hydrogen ammonia solutions um, for, for, a, for a future low carbon economy. Now, one thing is to be said, um, we, we're gonna have a video coming up on small scale ammonia plants, which, which I'm sure I'm gonna get some, some heat on that because people say, oh, you can't scale down the Haberbosch, but we're gonna go over that in the next video. So it should be interesting. So something quite interesting happens uh, with the, and kinetics of, of nickel corrosion. So what you find is that pure nickel actually corrodes at a higher rate than chromium um, ferrous alloys of nickel. So for a um, alloy 800, which you can see here is a uh, alloy 800, is alloy 800, it's, it's about 30% nickel. Um, I think about 20% chromium, the, the balance iron. So you, you find that obviously the corrosion rate for this alloy 800 is substantially lower than for the alloy 600 and the 304 and the 310. But what you find more interesting is compared to pure nickel. So there you have pure nickel up way high here and 800 all the way down here, right? So obviously something's going on here. What's going on is... Um, the the kinetics of this reaction so the presence of too few dissolved iron ions uh, or sufficient content of, of silicate through um, at, at a insufficient concentration nickel is in a passive state so when you're in passive state the corrosion rate is one um so which is why the the first study we went to actually was was quite accurate so this was a 
and canal six uh, six two five. This is in canal six two five. Um, point seven at EDC. Um, so in their case, um, if you if you go to um, you find that this the six hundred is actually higher. Six hundred is actually quite poor. Um, I, I think there's quite a bit of nickel in six hundred. It's it's, it's it's over sixty percent, or just around fifty five percent. But but the really good news is that you know one one, one UM per year, and, uh, mm-hmm. and and if you're in the active zone, uh, you you know insanely high corrosion rate. So. So the inhibiting effect of the iron and silicate ions uh, ions is due to the incorporation of these elements into the oxide layer and to change the uh, and, and, and to a change uh, of the nature of the nickel oxide. So the oxide layer is predominantly NiO and nickel hydroxide. So the nickel corrosion is inhibited when the oxide layer contains a sufficient amount of iron.